Hello, welcome to the UCSC Silicon Valley campus uh, information session for H1B holder, holders um, for what to do after a layoff. Um, so for today, um, we have a few different programs and folks coming together to kind of give an overview. Um, so we have two law firm representatives here to give an overview of the H1B process and options. We have folks from the basket engineering professional master's programs that will go over their programs and then also um, the UCSC extension professional certificate programs. Um, after everyone's done presenting all the programs and information, we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end um, to go over any questions um, that anyone has. Um, and you can put the questions in either the chat or the Q&A part of the webinar, and so we can go through them. Um, so first to go is Chu Law Firm. Thanks, Nisa. So uh, Deepika, would you like to say a few words about the firm and... Uh... Thank you, Dia. Um, hi, everyone. We represent Chug LLP. We are uh, based out of our headquarters is based out of the LA of, of the LA area, but we have offices all over the US. Uh, Min here is a senior partner, and uh, Dia is also a senior partner at Chug LLP at the New Jersey branch. Branch. Um, so we just decided to come on this call and help you all answer your questions. Dia, if you want to add anything else. Right. No, thank you, Deepika. So uh, you know these are obviously difficult times. Um, and we've been receiving a lot of requests for consultations, you know, questions about maintenance of H-1B status, um, you know, both uh, from uh, the Bay Area as well as all over the country. Um, so, um, you know, we'll just we'll take a few minutes just to go over the, the general options that we are presenting um, to, uh, you know, to the affected uh, people. Um, importantly, this is, you know, not to be construed as legal advice. Um, you know, we always recommend that you get, um, you know, individual advice because each person's situation is different. But um, just at a, uh, at a high level, you know, we'll just discuss the few uh, of the general um, alternatives available to people who have been laid off while in h &B status. So um, I will ask my colleague, uh, Min, uh, Mr. Min Kim, uh, uh, to just walk over the, uh, the things that we have in the bullet points here. Min? Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dia. Thank, uh, thank you, Deepika. So um, I, mean, I, I suppose, you know, in, in the limited amount of time that, that we have, uh, you know, uh, knowing uh, especially the, uh, the demographic and you know, the location of, uh, of our audience members uh, in, in attendance today, I um, mean, obviously, a lot of folks are in the, uh, the tech space, the technology space uh, within the, the greater Bay Area. Um, so we try to, uh, you know, kind of uh, fine tune and be uh, a little bit precise um, in talking about the H-1B visa category, um, you know, um, in general. And uh, we'll talk about specifically how, uh, you know, layoff situations might impact uh, someone's ability to be here in the in the U.S. Um, as well as uh, the amount of time that they might have and uh, when the clock when the clock starts ticking, uh, when uh, they would have to make plans to to uh, to depart. Uh, but just to kind of reiterate what what Dia mentioned. Um, you know, for folks who might be in other visa classifications, who might be impacted by layoffs, I suppose, you know, you know some, some of the rules that are unique to the H-1B uh, might not necessarily apply. So that's the reason why it's, uh, it's fairly critical uh, that uh, if you do want to seek out further information to, uh, you know, to look up a local counsel and try to retain an attorney so that, you know, he or she can provide uh, the best kind of advice uh, for your unique situation. Uh, but just generally speaking, uh, for someone who is here, um, you know, pursuant to a work visa category such as the H-1B for specialty occupation workers, uh, if uh, if there is a reduction in force by by the employer, and if a layoff did occur, uh, and such a separation of, of employment was there, uh, then the uh, individual, then the employee has about 60 days. Uh, a 60-day discretionary grace period applies. Uh, where uh, USCIS, the Immigration Service, allows that person to kind of reevaluate his or her options, as well as the options of their family members, um, so that, you know, if need be, they can make arrangements and have plenty of time to leave the country, or, uh, you know, if they do uh, intend to remain here in the U.S., perhaps pursue some secondary options of changing their visa status to another visa status, uh, so that they can continue to, uh, you know, remain in the U.S., and if, uh, you know, if possible, uh, you know, if they want to continue working, 
uh, perhaps look to uh, you know change their employer to another uh, H-1B employer by filing something called a transfer petition, an H-1B change of employer petition. Um, so I suppose uh, you know in a, in, in a in a in a large way uh, those are probably the uh, the more um, you know, common options uh, available for uh, for an H-1B employee who might have you know experienced a layoff, and uh, I suppose a uh, you know a direct corollary to that is you know how does that impact one's uh, status for any kind of joining family members? So you know, as most of the audience uh, knows, if someone is here pursuant to an H-1B visa approval, um, any kind of spouse or dependent children uh, who are derivatives of that principal applicant. They're here pursuant to an H-4 uh, dependent visa approval. Uh, so the similar rule applies to them as well. Um, you know, if it turns out that the person uh, who is here principally on an H-1B visa uh, does make arrangements to leave the U.S. within the allotted 60 days, um, you know, uh, it goes without saying that you know the family member should similarly make make those plans as well, uh, because uh, you know the 60-day benefit. Um, extends to those family members, uh, but anything beyond that will risk, uh, you know, the accrual of any kind of unlawful presence. And I suppose here I do want to kind of add that it's uh, it's discretionary uh, on the part of USCIS. They can or they cannot grant it. Uh, it really is up to their discretion and decision making. And it's not, it's it's the uh, the lesser of 60 days or whatever um, you know end date that's found in their I-94. So in, let's say that if someone is set to expire on their H-1B approval or the family members on their H-4 uh, within you know, 20 or 30 days, then um, you know, the, the fact that, you know, that the layoff occurred, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't add an, an additional allotted period of time beyond those 20, 30 days that were left on the I-94 admission period. So that's something important to keep in mind. Uh, Deepika, did, did you have anything that you wanted to add? To um, to uh, to any of those points? Yeah, I um, mean, one thing I wanted to make it very clear: it's it's sixty calendar days and not business days. So that is something which people should keep in mind. Uh, the six the the day the layoff starts, the day the 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 clock starts ticking, it's sixty days from that day. So sixty calendar days. That's something which I wanted to add. Oh, uh, what what about you, Dia? I suppose I you know I kind of address the the most commonly used, uh, you know, options that are available for, for uh, H-1B visa holders, um, you know, looking to perhaps port their H-1B to another employer or, um, you know, making arrangements to depart. Uh, but are, are some other, you know, options available for, for these uh, individuals who might be kind of stuck in this, uh, you know, in this circumstance? Yes, absolutely. So for those who are, you know, for various reasons, unable to find uh, a suitable h H-1B employer who might do a change of employer petition for them, uh, they could look at doing a change of status to some other, uh, uh, you know, to some other visa category, right? So uh, if you have a spouse who has uh, some sort of employment-based visa, like an H-1B or an L-1, you could consider an H-4 or an L-2 dependent visa, of course. A um, lot of people are also considering um, going back to school, right, and, you know, um, applying to schools uh, and provided they can complete the necessary formalities, like getting the I-20 and all in time, you know, just going back to F1 status. Um, with all of these, there are several things to be considered. One is the timing. Um, so the change of status application, whether it is to L2 or H4 or uh, a B2, which is, you know, for, um, you know, visitor visa status, or um, as we were just discussing, the F1 student visa status. Uh, anytime you file the change of status uh, application, you have to be in status, right? So necessarily you need to make that step within the 60 day period that we just talked about. Um, so that uh, would be paramount. And then for those who are going back to school, you know, the F1, um, you have to review and see if you are eligible to actually start classes. Uh, because for some situations, you can only start classes, start going to school once the application is approved. But um, in some situations, depending on the category that you're applying from, you may actually be able to start uh, school as soon as you file the application. So, um, you know, without going into too much detail, you know, these are um, some options uh, in terms of changing status. Um, and those uh, could also be considered. 
And for, uh, you know, some, I guess, you know, lucky ones who have reached uh, a little bit ahead in terms of their green card process, um, if you have a 485 application that is already filed and pending with uh, DHS, um, you could, uh, although we don't recommend it, you know, as immigration attorneys, we always recommend that people maintain their NIV, the non-immigrant status. But, uh, you know, if you've reached a certain stage, you, that is your I-140 petition has been approved and your 485 year adjustment application has been pending a while with USCIS over 180 days, um, you could also maybe think about, um, you know, giving up the h one status and just continuing based on the pending 485 application. So um, that's, you know, sometimes not desirable because you lose the safety net that is the H1B, the underlying H1B or the L1. But, um, you know, in, in a pinch, you could do that. Um, so I, I think, yeah, that, that's probably enough for now. And then maybe we can, you know, leave it open to the questions if people have specific questions. Yeah. Back to you, Nisa. So next we have Baskin School of Engineering, the professional master's program. So Emily, you wanna go ahead? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Emily. I'm a program coordinator for the Natural Language Processing Professional MS program. I'm just gonna introduce to now um, my colleagues from uh, the uh, other professional master's programs that are based in Silicon Valley as well. So um, uh, we're here to share information with you about the Games and Playable Media professional master's program. Uh, Lisa Schaefer will be uh, leading that um, set of slides for you so you can know that phenomenal program. We also uh, have uh, the Human uh, Computer Interaction Professional MS program. Um, Yasi Mogaram will be uh, presenting on, on that phenomenal program as well. And then I will share information with you about our unique natural language processing professional master's program. That, and all three programs are based uh, at our Silicon Valley campus location in Santa Clara, California. Um, you can learn more about graduate programs offered by Baskin Engineering um, at our website that's linked on this slide. And then all of the programs that we're gonna be talking about Today, uh, from provided by Baskin Engineering, are eligible for um, for the STEM extension um, in OPT. So I'll, I'll turn to my uh, colleague Lisa to share more about games and playable media uh, with you. Awesome, thank you, Emily. Um, I wanted to talk with you about our games and playable media professional MS program. Um, I handle the recruitment of applicants for this program. Um, overall, it's it's a video game design and development program. Um, it's a five quarter program that begins in the fall. Uh, we don't go to school in the summers. Um, and so uh, it, it starts, we only have one cohort that starts every September. Uh, our curriculum um, is, it covers four basic core competencies. And the first one is just overall game design and development. Um, that's where you learn the fundamentals of game engineering and you learn about, um, the overall view of game design systems and that sort of thing. We have people that come into our program that have different levels of programming experience. So if you don't have a lot of programming experience, you kind of get that from the get go. Uh, and if you already have programming experience, you can and do some other um, deep dives into game design and development um, right out the gate. Um, another core competency that we cover is um, game development technologies. That would be like, um, game engines like Unity and Unreal and um, other similar engines. We also do game user research, uh, storytelling, visual design, that sort of thing. We uh, dive into different game development technologies. Um, because we're a professional master's program, we also do a lot with um, professional development, working practices and, and industry standards and that sort of thing. So uh, another part that we focus on is the business of gaming and presentations and pitches, uh, pro project management, that sort of thing. We want our graduates to be able to go right into the video game world and know exactly what's going on. Uh, we want you to hit the ground running. Um, and then another core competency is specializations. Uh, some, the video game world has um, lots of different specializations, whether it's level design or art or audio. So. We'll give you the big picture idea, but we're also um, going to give you a core competency that you can then take a, and apply in your job search. And we find that has been really helpful in placing people in industry. Um, our applications open October 1st and they close in mid-January. So we, we just closed our application period on January 20th for the applicants coming um, for fall of 2023. 
Um, but if this is something of interest to you, then um, please, by all means, um, you can always reach out to us and ask questions now and be ready to hit the ground October 1st um, of 2023 for the next cohort. Um, the estimated total cost of the program is about $68,000 for non-residents. That covers tuition and fees for all five quarters. And we like to get uh, that information up front because um, if you're looking at other video game programs, um, some go four quarters, some go two years, and you know, basically everybody else is on the semester. So let's be honest about the quarter and semester system. But we want to make sure that we're really transparent as to how much the program will cost you. Um, we have um, alumni in all types of video game companies from AAA to indie and domestic to international. Um, could you slip to the next slide? This will show you, um, th this gives you an idea of where we place our alumni. Um, we also have some people that are interested in what we call serious games and we've placed people at um, Stanford Med because there's uh, different medical connotations that go with video game design. Um, but these are um, these are companies that our alumni are in, and you can tell that uh, we hit pretty much on everything that anybody is interested in. I think we have about 200 alumni now from our program, so um, we're really excited about our installed base of alumni out in the video game industry. Um, next slide. A lot of people ask about the uh, application, what it looks like, what's in it. Um, so just to give you a heads up on that. Uh, there's a statement of purpose, which is why you want to study video games. Um, a personal history statement, like how did you get to this point in your life? You know, what, what led you up to uh, this application? We ask for an unofficial transcript, um, three letters of recommendation, which don't have to be from faculty. It doesn't have to be from somebody that you've taken a class from. It can also be um, a manager or a colleague, or sometimes we even get uh, coaches if uh, you've done athletics in the past. Um, we have a wide range of who we accept letters of recommendations from. We also have an English profici proficiency element. Um, and you can see the TOEFL scores and the ITF scores that we need for that. But there's also a waiver. So if you've done your undergraduate at an English speaking institution, then um, we can waive uh, that English proficiency requirement. The last portion that's kind of unique to games and playable media is the online portfolio. And we would ask that you create a website and it's not a website design program. So it's just a simple website, a dedicated placeholder, so to speak, that would have links to um, different things that you've worked on that are somewhat game, game related or at least uh, digitally digital media related. And a lot of times those are just still images or photos, but also interactive pieces, you know, technological processes. We just ask that if it's a group project, you let us know which parts of the application, I mean, sorry, which parts of the um, program you contributed to, if that makes any sense. Um, but we totally accept group projects on the online portfolio. Um, so I think that pretty much sums up what Games and Playable Media is about. And I'm going to turn it over to Yasi so she can talk a little more about HCI. Hi, everyone. So I'll tell you real quickly a little bit of, about the Human Computer Interaction Program at UC Santa Cruz, um, uh, the, the MS Professional Master's Program. And uh, next slide, please. What is HCI? It's really the uh, field of study that uh, basically uh, optimizes user experiences and interactions between computer devices and people. And there are other names it's known for by UX design, UI design, system design. All of those are um, what uh, you might know in industry uh, that are in academia is known as HCI. It is an interdisciplinary field and it is a um, it's an emerging field and it's a growing field. So students that come to us come with computer science background, behavioral science, social sciences, um, some from design and um, media studies and humanities. So it's a it is a wide spectrum of backgrounds um, that go to pursue HCI and then careers in design. 
Next slide, please. So our program is uh, relatively new. We, uh, the, uh, we are in our second year and co our cohort has grown um, uh, double the size uh, since we started. And um, in what we do in our program is really a balance between academic rigor and um, application in industry. Uh, and that's how we have designed our curriculum. So the, um, the program is four quarters long uh, with a summer in between. So it's 15 months uh, with a summer in between that students go to pursue internships. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so some of the careers that our graduates uh, pursue, uh, are in product design, interaction design, um, digital design, um, uh, the UX designer, UX researchers, and um, some go to pursue UX writing and uh, content design. Uh, so these are some of the, the, the job titles that people have in industry, and some go to become product managers Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of our curriculum, and I won't go in details into this, but um, uh, what you see in yellow is basically courses that we offer and programs that uh, we offer in partnership with industry partners. Uh, and um, so, we really maintain that balance of uh, applicability and academic uh, rigor. And um, so we have basically a, a seminar series that goes across uh, the program um, that invites industry speakers and is really geared for uh, career development. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, two classes that constitute one capstone project, and it is 15 hours of the total 48 hours of HCI MS program. Um, and that's where students actually work with an industry um, sponsor on a real world problem. Uh, and the first part of the uh, program, the first two quarters, is more focused on theory. Um, and then the second part is more uh, focused on practice. And throughout our program, um, we offer a mentor, one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorships. We have a mentor coalition of UX, UI designers and researchers and uh, that are from, uh, uh, some really marquee companies and startups. And so it's a spectrum that we cover and nonprofits. Um, next slide, please. So um, uh, I think this one we can, uh, in the interest of time, because I just, I did explain about the capstone project. So um, um uh, let's go to the next slide. So our mentor coalition, uh, we start from the beginning, pair up um, each student with at least one mentor. Um, this quarter, we have uh, 37 mentors in our mentor coalition and only 22 students. So a lot of times students get more mentors um, uh, than one. And uh, we try to cover a spectrum, of course, uh, HCI graduates uh, really love to work in uh, fan companies. And, um, and so we have uh, fan companies covered, but also there are a uh, tremendous amount of opportunities across different industries. So, um, uh, in healthcare, in uh, in um, transportation, and and so we try to cover all of those areas um, beyond the big tech, um, which is germane really to this conversation. 
And uh, what students get as part of mentorship is every quarter, at least three times, they'll meet with their mentor, either uh, on Zoom or in person. And the minimum requirements on mentors is that to meet with students at least 30 minutes, um, three times every quarter. Uh, and a lot of times our mentors actually allocate more time. And also our mentors um, participate in our seminar classes. So it is an ongoing um, interaction between industry and uh, uh, our mentor coalition. Next slide, please. So some important dates. Uh, we actually have an info session uh, tomorrow night. Um, uh, I have put registration links on um, the slide and I'm, I'm not sure if the slides will be available to you, but uh, you can reach out to me at hci at ucsc.edu if you have any questions or are interested to register. Um, and then our application deadline, we, the, the window for application is still open. Uh, and the deadline is February 15th. Uh, and um, uh, you can learn, again, click on that link that will give you all the information where to apply and how to apply. Um, and next slide, please. Yeah, if you have any questions, including uh, what we require as part of the application process, you can either go to um, uh, the website I provided in the previous slide or send uh, us a note at hci at ucsc.edu. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions during the Q&A. Nisa, back to you or Emily. <laughs> Thanks, Yassi, and thank you, Lisa, for sharing uh, a bit about both of uh, your programs. I, I appreciate being on the team with you for Baskin's Professional Master's programs. Um, I'm also very grateful to be part of today's event um, because there are so many different study paths um, that are available to you as, as you navigate all your options as part of your job transition. So grateful to be able to share um, one among many options that um, are, are available to you for consideration. So I represent the Natural Language Processing Master Science Professional Program at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and so I'll share a bit about uh, our field and then also uh, the unique benefits of our program. And I'll close up with uh, steps for applying because we're currently accepting applications for fall 2023 admission consideration. Next slide, please. Before we jump into the specifics of the NLP program, let's talk about the field for a moment. Uh, it's likely that you've already encountered uh, NLP methods or algorithms before joining our call or even during this call, because a lot of technologies uh, draw from NLP. Um, it's the development of computer programs that can understand, generate, and learn from human language. NLP has been around since the 1940s, and the field is growing rapidly as more and more natural language data is being digitized. Uh, we're seeing NLP commonly used in AI applications, uh, but we're also seeing a demand for NLP expertise growing across multiple industries. Uh, so it's used in um, query and document understanding in, in search engines. It's also used in opinion mining and sentiment analysis in website reviews. Uh, we're also looking at automatic machine translation in language translation apps, and NLP is uh, forms um, the the mechanisms and algorithms behind uh, dialogue systems and natural language understanding and generation that's uh, used by virtual pers uh, personal assistants and chatbots. Uh, so lots of uh, different opportunities to apply NLP skills. Um, we're seeing uh, NLP engineer positions requiring skills in natural language processing, computer science, and data science. So with that in mind, we created um, UCSC's natural language processing program to ensure our UCSC students um, had an opportunity to launch successful careers in this growing field. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about the unique benefits of this program. Our program is based at uh, UCSC's state-of-the-art facilities in Santa Clara, California, uh, at our Silicon Valley campus location. It gives students the opportunity to build their professional networks while advancing their expertise um, through their NLP coursework. Industry collaboration is at the heart of everything we do in the NLP MS program. Our curriculum is informed by our NLP scientists and industry experts who form um, our industry advisory board. 
Our industry advisors come from a variety of, uh, of organizations, like uh, from large scale multinational companies like Microsoft and Amazon, but as well as from uh, Silicon Valley startups like SliceX AI. Uh, our industry experts also provide guest lectures in our courses, um, and they teach some of our core and elective classes as well. And they mentor uh, capstone projects so that students can gain valuable industry insight and uh, career advice while they're applying their learning through a multi-quarter uh, capstone project that addresses a real-world NLP challenge. Our program also offers a flexible set of degree plans so that students can graduate in 15 to 18 months. So both you can graduate in under, in under two years. Um, you can take the summer off in both of those plans to pursue optional independent research or internships. And uh, the plans allow you to uh, tailor the pace and structure of, of your course plan so that it meets your learning needs and also your professional aspirations. Um, we offer a world-class education opportunity, uh, which is exclusive to NLP students. This means that you'll have enhanced individualized support from faculty uh, whose industry and high impact research experience informs the way that they teach. You'll also be joining a close-knit NLP community at UCSC uh, who will become your lifelong peers and colleagues um, in the field that you choose to work in. Um, we're also seeing a demand for NLP expertise grow across multiple industries. And so our foundational courses enable students to gain the skills they need to be uh, successful in uh, this rapidly growing NLP field. But also you gain transferable skills in machine learning and data science that can be used to uh, and applied to solving a variety of problems in different industries and fields from fraud detection to advertising and recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. So that um, I wanted to share a little bit about where our alumni are currently. We're in the third year of our program. So we have two cohorts of alum who graduated for the program and now have gone on to work in a variety of organizations, including those uh, featured on this slide. Most of our alum are working as machine learning engineers and data scientists in a variety of organizations, ranging from startups to large scale international organizations. We're also excited that we have uh, to share that we have alumni attending uh, the computer science and engineering PhD program at UC Santa Cruz. And so we believe that the program we offer provides um, strong and excellent preparation for advanced studies like a doctoral program, uh, if that's also something on your mind for your career aspirations. One of our students also was able to initiate and sell their own startup after graduating from the program. And you can read more about their experience on our website. Next slide, please. So if NLP is, is, is calling your attention and you feel uh, ready to take on this master's program, uh, here's how you'd apply. Um, you'd apply by uh, visiting um, our website or going to our, um, you can check out our admissions page uh, for guidance on how to get to the, uh, the formal application page. You can apply by March 1st for fall 2023 admission consideration. Um, and some of the uh, essential admission requirements are also listed on our admissions page. So I wanna talk uh, to those um, points uh, briefly uh, before we close up this round of slides. So we're looking for students to have a bachelor's in computer science, but we're open to other disciplines. We've had students who majored in cognitive science previously and minored in computer science or uh, focused primarily on linguistics, but had program, uh, programming skills that they built through professional experience. So as long as you can demonstrate in your application um, that you, you meet these kind of essential requirements. Uh, you don't have to specifically have a traditional computer science bachelor's degree. Uh, we are looking for students to have an overall GPA of 3.2 or higher. And then, as I mentioned, excellent programming skills demonstrated through academic coursework that you've taken or through professional experience you have, you've, you've gained. If you list a language other than uh, English as your primary language in the application, you might see a TOEFL or IELTS requirement appear for our program. TOEFL requirement of 100 or higher and an IELTS score of seven uh, or higher. Um, this, as uh, Lisa mentioned though, there are opportunities for uh, requesting a waiver to this requirement. Um, and you can learn more about that on our graduate admissions pages. Uh, we're also looking for students to demonstrate they have prior coursework in discrete math, data structures and algorithms and probability and statistics. But if, if you feel like you've gained this experience through a Coursera course or maybe not through tra traditional academic settings, no problem, you can just elaborate on that in your personal history statement. So just generally, if you feel like you don't quite meet one of these requirements, no worries, we're here to support your experience applying to this program. 
you would just elaborate in your personal history statement how you might meet those requirements in maybe a, a, a more non-traditional way, either through lived professional experience you've gained or self-directed projects you've done. Um, and then if you've also encountered any challenges that might have affected your GPA, feel welcome to elaborate on that so we get to know you as a learner and as a professional in your, your essays. Uh, so with that, we'll turn to the next slide. So as I close, I just want to um, let you know that uh, our NLP support team is here to help uh, help you through uh, the, NAP, the application process. So you can email us directly at the, um, the address that I've listed on this slide. You can also check out our website. There's a lot of detailed information about our curriculum, uh, your flexible degree plans, and more. You can follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Reddit, and Twitter. In fact, you can chat with a current student um, if you check out our Reddit page. You can also meet one-on-one uh, -on -one with a student ambassador. Uh, we have current students who are ready to help answer questions you might have about the program, their experience living and studying in Silicon Valley, or the application process. Um, and they host weekly virtual office hours, uh, and, those, uh, and their schedule is linked on this slide. You can also meet with our NLP executive director. His next virtual office hours are on February 14th at 9 a.m. So great opportunity to talk about the um, NLP curriculum and the capstone experience as well. And then a couple reminders I wanted to share with you. Um, the application deadline for fall 2023 admission consideration is March 1st. And then we also have two info sessions that are coming up. We've got an info session tomorrow at, at noon um, Pacific time. Uh, so that's January 31st or join us on February 8th uh, for our last info session of, uh, of the admissions period. So we hope to see you at those info sessions. And again, thank you for letting us share a bit about our professional master's programs with you. Thank you so much, Lisa, Emily, and Yasi. Um, it is so great sharing this building with the Baskin Engineering folks and very grateful that we get to collaborate on these things together. Um, so my name is Nisa. I'm going to be talking about the UCSC Silicon Valley Extension Professional Certificate Programs. Um, so these are shorter programs. Are, are They're either nine months or three quarters, uh, with some programs taking four quarters. Um, and they, you complete about 25 to 30 units, um, and the price range is about $11,000 to $18,000, and then students are, may be eligible for one year of OPT. Unfortunately, our programs are not eligible for the STEM OPT extension like the master's programs are, um, but you still get the one year. Um, so for the certificate curriculum, we have five areas of study, uh, biosciences, business, design, education, and technology. Uh, 17 certificate programs are eligible for international students, and we have 38 certificates and specializations overall, um, any of which can be completed as a secondary program. Um, so to kind of go more into these, oops. Um, biosciences, we have biotechnology, clinical trials, regulatory affairs. In design, we have a user experience and web design certificate. Um, and in education, we have early childhood education and TESOL. Uh, for business, we have business administration, human resource management, marketing management, project and program management, and procurement and supply chain management. Oops. Um, and then technology, we have computer programming, data science and data analytics, embedded systems, Linux programming and administration, software engineering and quality, and VLSI engineering. And for secondary specializations um, that you can complete alongside some of these are um, artificial intelligence, DevOps and data visual virtualization, mobile application development, Python, Java development, data engineering, or data science. Um, so some of our instructors in our programs, um, as you can see, they are all have a ton of industry experience. They're currently working in the field. So they kind of work, have their day jobs where they're cur currently working in industry and they come here and teach part time at night. Um, so all of our instructors, you know, are really up to date on the most um, recent technologies being used. They have, you know, um, real life projects that they're working on that they'll kind of bring into the classroom sometimes um, to talk about so that you can really see what they're doing, what's happening in the field now. And then also your classmates are usually in industry as well. Um, so there's a lot of really good networking going on with instructors and classmates when um, you're taking these courses. Um, for OPT, to qualify for OPT, um, students must study for at least nine months, complete the certificate program and maintain their F1 status. Um, our students mostly have OPT in technology, um, business, then bioscience and design. Um, and so 
the two most popular programs are areas are technology and business for us, but other students as well get their OPT and you know the other industries. Um, OPT can last up to one year and you can work anywhere in the US as long as the job is related to your studies. Um, so you don't have to stay here in Silicon Valley, although most of the students do stay here in Silicon Valley um, since there are many opportunities. And we hold an OPT workshop every quarter to help you prepare um, and to apply and answer any questions that you have. Um, our international students, we have tried to have a lot of events and networking opportunities. So we have mixers, socials, um, movie days. Um, we also have an open house um, offer um, professional development opportunities, like we did a LinkedIn lab, we also do uh, various interview and resume workshops, um, and then many other networking and professional development opportunities um, throughout the quarter and throughout the year. Uh, so for the entry requirement, so you must have a college degree, either an associate's, bachelor's, master's, or doctorate, doctor level or equivalent. Um, English proficiency, you have a TOEFL of 70, IELTS of 6, or a Duolingo of 95. Um, or you can request a waiver if you have at least two years in the U.S. with relevant worker school experience. Um, must show a bank statement of $30,000 to cover living expenses and tuition costs. And you must provide your passport or previous visa I-20 I-94 um, with your application materials. So how to apply? Um, you can submit an application um, and all the materials are on our website um, with the supporting documents. Um, you'll be notified in about three to five business days um, if you're accepted. Um, then you pay our application fee, which is about $150. Um, and then you notify us when your visa has been approved or your transfer form has been completed. And then um, you will arrive to UCSC Extension and attend a one-day orientation. So we have rolling admissions with students starting every quarter. Um, so for the spring quarter, um, the last day to apply would be February 15th. Um, if you are a new F1 student um, or if you are transferring from an F1 um, visa at a different institution, um, then that deadline would be March 1st. Um, so that is all I have for now. Um, do we have any questions? I'm opening up a, for any of the programs um, or for um, the CHU representatives. Um, so for the questions, if you can enter them into the Q&A part, um, that way we can all see them and we can talk about them. I know someone had posed a question earlier um, as a limit, if there's a limitation to change from F1 back to H1B visa, what documents should they provide to recapture the, the remaining H1B as long as possible? Um, and if they can reconnect to their previous employer, what documents should they request to the previous employer to prove that end time of employment? Um, Min, can you go over your response to that question just so everyone can hear? Sure. Um, right. So, I mean, if, uh, from what I understand, uh, uh, you know, the, the person asking the question was that, um, you know, he, uh, he or she held H-1B status before and they're looking to perhaps change status, you know, and go back to, uh, to a work visa status as an H-1B employee and perhaps uh, kind of go back to their previous employer. So, uh, so, so that is doable, um, you know, as long as there's time left there, um, you know, pursuant to their earlier, you know, H H-1B. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, that, that shouldn't be an issue, I suppose. Uh, it seems like, you know, uh, the concern that that person had who, who posed the question was that maybe they were kind of running out of time on their, on their H-1B. So, uh, you know, that can be documented, um, you know, I suppose, you know, the two main resources are the I-94 travel history, just kind of recording uh, the, the dates that uh, they came into the U.S., um, you know, and um, started accruing that, that H-1B status here, here in the U.S., as well as the, uh, you know, the, the, the pages on their passport where uh, recording, um, you know, the, the, the times that they were inspected by CBP and then entered through the port of entry as an H-1B employee. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, just, uh, you know, the, the person should just kind of pull up those, those records and, um, you know, try to seek local counsel and see if, uh, if there's time permitting uh, for, for them to revert back to H-1B status. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions from any of the participants? It seems you, you and I did a great job of educating everyone on their options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are there any other last, um things that people want to say or might be helpful for those who are looking to apply or anyone looking to change their status um helpful hints tricks anything like that um i can share a few tips for applying for um, an advanced degree if that's helpful um 
we recommend uh, if knowing that each of our programs will require three letters of recommendation, uh, we recommend starting that process uh, as soon as possible when you know you want to apply to graduate school. Let your network know, reach out to uh, professors that you've uh, taken classes with um, or um, also uh, connect with any uh, project supervisors or internship supervisors who have who can attest to your uh, your capacities and skills in the, the area you're applying for. This tends to be um, the most challenging of the application requirements is to make sure you've, you've lined up all of your recommendations by the application date. So getting a head start on that can, can be helpful. Um, also, go through all of your application materials before you submit. Make sure that they're clear and concise, but they also tell a really compelling story all together about who you are as a professional, um, what you're aspiring to, to gain as part of a master's or a, a doctoral program, um, and what you're, um, what you're aspiring to do with your degree as well, what kinds of problems uh, societally or um, technically you want to help solve. Um, and I imagine those tips also apply to, um, to uh, the application process for the extension programs as well, um, especially with compelling and concise materials that you put together. Uh, I mean, I, I suppose from an immigration, um, you know, point of view, uh, and this kind of goes back to, um, you know, kind of retaining trusted counsel. Um, so, you know, one, one of the one of the unique features about, you know, immigration is that it is so dynamic and it evolves uh, pretty quickly. So, um, you know, on, on a moment's notice, the immigration agency might kind of release new new news that might directly impact uh, H-1B employees or, you know, former H-1B employees who, you know, unfortunately have been let go. Uh, so, so one thing is, um, you know, the option to premium process. Um, so, you know, uh, what the news that came, that was released is that, uh, you know, USCIS is now um, willing to go back to the old policy of adjudicating a dependent spouse uh, change of status application, um, along with the principal applicants of uh, you know, H-1B premium process petition. Um, I suppose long story short means that if you know if, uh, if a person is kind of running out of options and they but they have a spouse who you know let's say uh, is an L1 employee or an H1B employee themselves, um, but they're looking to um, you know perhaps change status so that they can remain in the U.S. I suppose before uh, they had to wait months because you know USCIS did not choose to bundle those two things together, but now they re revert it back to the old way of uh, of uh, willing to do that. So, uh, you know, that's going to be of considerable help for uh, for individuals kind of stuck in that situation, especially knowing that, um, you know, someone like an L2 spouse, um, they have work authorization incident to status, meaning that they don't have need, they don't need a separate document in order to uh, in order to gain work, you know, work authorization. So I suppose those are the unique features that, uh, you know, uh, people should keep in mind. And that's uh, that's the reason why uh, for for whatever situation people find themselves in. Um, you know, um, look up a, a trusted immigration advisor to, uh, to kind of walk you through. Nisa, I also wanted to add that, you know, you all offer this STEM OPT program, right? And I'm sure a lot of these students must be facing challenges with their 983s when they're filling up their 983s. So if any of your students ever want any assistance or guidance with just to understand how the 983 has to be filled in, you know, we are always available and they can connect with us and we can kind of guide them with the 983 form because that's a very important form when it comes to applying for the STEM extension, OBT. Great, thank you, that's super helpful. So someone just asked another question, said, could I recapture the time between the end date of the previous, like the end date is one uh, fifteen, and leave by March 1st? Um, could I recapture the time from January 15th to March 1st? Um, the time stayed in the US 60 day period, but no longer working. Does someone from Chu wanna take that one? Men, you want to answer that or? A difficult day. Did, did, did you want to? Oh, sorry. Uh, let me just uh, look at the question. So the question yeah. is, can I recapture the time between the end date of the previous and the dates leaving and the date of leaving the U.S.? Uh, I mean, I think it's talking about more about the recapture period from the six years, right? So um, I don't know if we understood the question, but if the question is, how much time can you recapture? You you can recapture any time that was not spent in the US, right? So if you have an approval for three years, an H-1B approval typically for three years, and you only spent two years in the US, right? So that one year left on the petition, that can be recaptured. Uh, I don't know if that's, is that, uh, oh, okay. So the question is whether the 60 day 
period uh, can be recaptured. The time spent in the US, uh, uh, you know, the 60 day grace period, whether that uh, is eligible for recapture. Uh, I don't believe it is. Uh, what do you think, Min and Deepika? Yeah. I, I agree. I, it's uh, it's not. Um, yeah, I think it's yeah. It's time spent in the U.S. in H one B status grace period, and you're not working. We get that, but um, you know, I I don't think USCIS would distinguish that. Um, you know, from uh, you know the the regular time that you spend in H one B status. So I'm inclined to say no that you can't recapture the grace period. I agree to the uh, on that. So again, you know, the good news about um, the change of status uh, applications uh, back to F1 status, um, it used to be that during the pandemic, you know, it, it took over 12 months. I think we had cases which took 12 to 15 months to get approved. But um, of late, I think those applications are getting processed fairly quickly. Of course, each case is different, but, you know, I, I, I think in the last few months, we've seen F1 applications, change of um, status applications back to student status get approved and as quickly as I think four to five months. Um, so, you know, that's definitely a, a silver lining. And the other thing I, you know, I tell my clients is, um, you know, for us, uh, for immigration practitioners, when we, you know, when we are preparing these applications, we look at uh, the I-20, the admitting, you know, the admittance letter from the university and all of that. And then also uh, the proof of funding. So, you know, if you think you're going back to school, then that might be something to focus on, you know, the proof of funding and your, you know, your, the school will also ask for it. Um, but, you know, that's uh, some homework that you can do in the meantime. Right. Uh, anything else? I haven't seen any other questions come up, um, but thank you so much. That was very helpful information. I know personally, um, we used to see change of statuses taking like 12 to 18 months. So we would not recommend that since our programs are only nine. They would finish before they got the change of status was even um, approved. <laughs> um, so it's good that it only happens in four to five. So that's that's very good information to know. Um, but I think if those are all the questions, um, then we can end five minutes early. Um, thank you all to everyone who came in to present the information. I know the um, attendees really know it's good to kind of pick everyone's brains on these things since you're all the, the subject matter experts. So um, thank you all and have a great rest of the week. Thank you, thank you Nisa. Thanks. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.